Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. In the late 19th century, five white settler societies came to fear being swamped by the lower races. And drawing the global colour line is Henry Reynolds and Marilyn Lake's account of the steps that were taken, firstly by the southern states of the United States immediately after the Civil War, to disenfranchise and segregate African Americans, Negroes. It's an account of what happened in California and in British Columbia, which I find deliciously and together were known then and will now be known as the Pacific Slope. The steps that were taken in California and in British Columbia to exclude, to disenfranchise and segregate Japanese. The steps that were taken in Natal in Southern Africa to exclude, disenfranchise Indians. And the steps that were taken in the Australian colonies to exclude and disenfranchise Chinese and then forcibly repatriate Kanakas. It is a terrible tale, very beautifully told. It's a tale of the powerlessness or the unwillingness of London and Washington to combat the racial fears of these settler societies. It's a tale of gorgeously beautiful rhetoric used to clothe the racial bigotry of these societies. And it is, I fear to tell you, fresh embarrassment for the Australian people, because the book demonstrates without any doubt whatever that Australia wasn't just being swept along in the current as these things were happening, but we were pioneers. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Marilyn Lake and Henry Reynolds. This Red Hot book, which was launched on Friday of last week by Malcolm Fraser, um, is a book that I know that probably there's not a single person in this tent has yet read, but I know you all will read. I've heard books overpraised badly in the last couple of days, in my opinion. <laughs> I won't name the novelists who had rhapsodies um, sung to their faces. I kept quiet up the back. But this is a very fine book. It is terrific. Ladies and gentlemen, Marilyn Lake and Henry Reynolds. questions every now and again. One of the things that I became very curious about in this book was the notion of the Negro problem. So much of this is about language, fabulous language, the language of manhood and character. This wonderful verb to swamp, which is throughout the book, the notion of swamping. But the Negro problem was, as I understand from the argument of the book, proof that was provided after the United States Civil War that you simply couldn't have white men and women, black men and women, together in the one franchise, in the one society, but it just didn't work. What happened? Why did this idea come to grip? All of these societies, that there was proof, scientific proof, that you just couldn't live together. One of the arguments we wanted to make in the book and um, demonstrate was the conversation that went around the world um, between various white men, they are mainly men, I should say, when they discussed the possibility of a multiracial democracy. Because these countries are also at the forefront of democratic reform, which is crucial. And they look to history, and particularly recent American history, after the Civil War, when blacks are enfranchised in the South after the Civil War. And the consensus becomes that it's just a disaster. That black men are simply unfitted for democracy, for self-government. And one of the leading commentators, James Bright, who's a British liberal politician and historian, um, publishes this at length in his 
gigantic survey called the American Commonwealth. And this book, for example, has enormous impact in Australia. The federal farmers in the 1890s refer to it constantly, and in South Africa, where it's credited with being a main source of ideas for segregation. So the idea was that the United States had experimented with multiracial democracy. It was a complete failure, and it simply couldn't be. And therefore, to safeguard democracies, they needed to be racially homogeneous. Yes, I think it's um, I think it's important to appreciate, as, as Marilyn has already intimated, that we're talking about uh, societies that were amongst the most progressive in the world in many ways. Uh, they were societies of European settlers, fairly recent societies. They were among the most democratic in the world. They were societies where the labour movement had, was probably the most powerful, far more powerful than Europe. They were societies generally with very high standards of living. But going beyond the experience that they assumed had been proved in the southern states of the USA was the, at the very heart of the thinking of liberal democracy that you would only have a democracy in a homogeneous society. Now at the same time, uh, this was the basic and the very heart of the idea of 19th century nationalism. So both nationalism and liberal democracy preach the necessity of homogeneous populations. This is the argument of the central figure of 19th century liberal philosophy, John Stuart Mill, and basically said, to have a democracy, you must have a society that is homogeneous without significant minorities. So there is this pressure from the very heart of Europe, which is acted out in the secular societies that we've written about. But, in, but beyond that, there's no doubt that the southern intellectuals and historians uh, had convinced the world that the Reconstruction had been a disastrous, and yet, on any objective account, the progress made by Afro-Americans in the second half of the 19th century was absolutely extraordinary. But even before the United States Civil War, we, on this continent, were already leading the way in Victoria. Yes, I mean, one of the things that I found, which I thought was quite extraordinary really, is that Victoria as a colony in the 1850s was probably the first place in the world to introduce race-based immigration restriction. The first place in the world that actually defined immigrants in the legislation as an adult male of Chinese descent. You know, that this is an immigrant and we will restrict the immigration of these people and they did it um, through a sort of tonnage requirement of ships that only so many complete with ships burden would be allowed into the country. And this, of course, was in response to the very large migration of Chinese people onto the gold fields in the 1850s. So at the height of that, something like a sixth of gold miners were Chinese. And I think what's interesting, what historians haven't um, brought together before, is that the 1850s was the de decade of democratic nation building in Australia. I mean, the 1850s is where manhood suffrage is introduced into Victoria. It's no accident, I think, you know, that this conjuncture of democracy, manhood suffrage, self-government is occurring at the same time as the first moves to try and make the society, again, racially homogeneous. Indeed, as I understand from the book, um, one, of the, one of the issues on which the colonies, not just here, but also in Canada, um, are most vociferous about their dignity as independent colonies is on the question of race. This is this represents their independence from the high flown sentiments of London. The, the, the independence is we out here in the colonies know what reality is really like, and that means race restrictions. Yeah. In the background of uh, certainly the, the societies that are part of the British Empire is the 
doctrine that was absolutely central to the empire that there would be no distinctions on the basis of race. This was the only way in which this extraordinarily mixed empire could be held together. And the argument always was, uh, even more specifically, that the common law could take no, pay no attention to race. So that the doctrine of the empire was that there would be no distinctions. But this clearly did not suit and was not accepted by the white secular societies. And I think as, as Marilyn has mentioned in a number of places, the achievement of control over immigration was the way in which these societies declared their independence and their sovereignty against the central doctrine of empire. And so by the first years of the 20th century, the policy makers in London faced this terrible dilemma where Australia and New Zealand and South Africa were insisting that they could introduce racial, racial discrimination, when on the other hand, the British were trying to keep together a multiracial empire and trying to convince the Indian intellectuals, and nationalists in particular, that the empire paid no attention to race. So really, the empire was being pulled apart and the white settler societies played a major role in this because, in a way, it was their will that prevailed. And eventually, by the, certainly by you know, the First World War, uh, it was the will of the white settler societies that prevailed over the central doctrine of a multiracial empire. One of the ways we can understand the Declaration of White Australia in 1901, Barton, the first Prime Minister, for example, says, we've decided to make a declaration of our racial identity. And he sees this as central to the Commonwealth, the meaning of the Commonwealth. And I think one of the ways we can understand White Australia is it is the Australian Declaration of Sovereignty. That is the Australian announcement of sovereignty. So in a sense, the technical issue of whether or not Australia is actually a republic becomes less pressing and less urgent for these nation builders once they've declared this and put this in place. This is the battle they were prepared to have with Britain, and this was the battle that they often said they were prepared to separate from Britain on. This would be the American Revolution for Australia. So Britain indeed backs down. Britain can't afford to lose the white dominion. It's in a context with the sort of increasing threat of Germany. In Europe, for example, the, the coming world war as it happens, and Britain realises it needs to do this, you know, to make up the firepower of the coming war. Before we put the boot into London again and again and again, um, let's just pause and Aaron and Henry, can you put together a little compendium of all of the issues on which Australia now led the way that, that can be called in the world the Australian model? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that it's very hard for us now to grasp is the, is the intertwining of radical progressive measures such as a living wage, for example. Australia led the way in institutionalising a living wage and the harvest judgment in 1907. And this was completely intertwined with the idea that they were safeguarding white manhood, white workers. You know, the two things went together. So Australia, on one hand, leads the way indeed in all sorts of progressive measures, including the living wage and hidden pensions and age old pensions. But all of these social welfare provisions and the maternity allowance are race-based. They're racially exclusive. The, the vision of a welfare state is a race-based welfare state. Uh, yes, the, uh, the uh, celebrated 19th, 20th century Australian historian, Keith Hancock, W.K. Hancock, in a very famous book called Australia, published in 1930, said of the white Australia policy, it was the indispensable condition of every other Australian policy. And in a sense, that is the thing we've forgotten. We look back and see white Australia as perhaps an aberration, something that we now find abhorrent, and it was something that could be simply sloughed off, leaving uh, all the rest there. But in the, at the time of the Federation, uh, race was 
seen as overwhelmingly important. There was a growing sense that there was a coming conflict between the white and coloured races. The first stirrings of colonial nationalism gave the sense that there was indeed a rising tide of colour. And race, in the sense that it was implemented in Australia, was a very progressive idea. The, we, we have to separate out our view of the way we see it now and put it back in its context where it was the central organising principle of early Australia. It, it, in some ways, Hancock um, is virtually saying that this policy is what gained Australia its drive and its self-confidence. And that is perhaps the hardest thing for this generation to appreciate. I mean, it's also true, as David suggests, that the rest of the world indeed was looking on, as it were. I was doing some research in Boston in the Immigration Restriction League papers um, for the United States, and as soon as the white Australia legislation was passed in Australia, they got hold of copies of the legislation. They would get them all in and they would read them and look through them and be encouraged in their own efforts to introduce race uh, immigration restriction, for example. But of course also they knew that Australia was a very progressive place in general. It had womanhood suffrage, for example, which the United States or you know, no other countries had except New Zealand. So they were very keen to follow Australia and to follow the Australian example. And I think it's very interesting to realise that the United States doesn't pass comprehensive immigration restriction legislation until as late as 1924, you know, so it's quite conscious that it's following a long way behind Australia. Well, they're simply refusing to do what I'm asking them to do, so I may have to do it myself, and <laughs> that's my memory can do. Now, in 1850s there is a limit the limits are placed on Chinese immigration in Victoria, and that was a world first, we now believe. Then in the 1880s, Chinese immigration was absolutely banned from Victoria. More or less. More or less. And that again was a world first, wasn't it? Well, that was happening about the same time as the um, American Chinese exclusion law, which was 1882. So those two are going in tandem. And then we get mixed up in the notion of a literacy test. Yes. Um, and it's so wonderful to reflect on the late government's literacy test before anybody. As you read this book, you're thinking, gosh, some of this is for you. It seems like yesterday. It seems like yesterday. Sometimes, obviously, it's like today. Um, and you read the rhetoric of the inevitable clash of race. And I'm thinking of the inevitable clash of religion and how you can't have people as citizens who can't speak English. That's from the 19th century, and that's all about keeping dark people out of the country. Um, so, <coughs> sorry, nothing changed much. But uh, then we have the dictation test. Now, how was it Australia? Was Australia had a unique use of the dictation test? In that we, we, we put a particular spin on it. Well, what, again, one of the things that's interesting is that in a way, historians think about our dictation test in 1901 as quite original. But in fact, in this case, we followed the United States, that is specifically Mississippi. Mississippi was the first state in the world to introduce a literacy or um, education test to, to explicitly disenfranchise black voters. You know, it had a specific racial intention. And then that was followed in the Cape Colony in South Africa, and then um, South Africa also followed with its own dictation literacy test, and then Australia picks up on that idea in 1901. Ours is quite specific because we turned it into a dictation words, dictation test, 50 words in a European language. You know, so that as the literacy test passes around the world, its content changes, and also the groups of people at whom it's directed often change. You know, blacks in Mississippi, Japanese in Australia, but it serves the same function. And what David said is absolutely right. The recent literacy tests or education tests or citizenship tests that have been introduced is exactly on the same model because it's disguising its real intention, which is by and large to keep out people we don't like. And, and but Australia had originally, as I marvelled to the discovery of the book, Australia originally said that the, the, the text for entry into Australia was going to be dictation in English. But then London objected. Yes, actually, in fact, in that sense, um, 
the Australian government seems to be rather progressive. I mean, it made the point that what well, English is our national language, so at least it should be in English. And um, London, in this case, objected and said no, because if we, they would be discriminating against white men, that is French and Germans and Scandinavians, you know. Um, you can't be discriminating against white men. In fact, one of the British men said, is that why we're fighting the war in South Africa? Is the unity and solidarity of white men. They actually explicitly make that connection. Which, of course, opened the way to the delicious use of Gaelic. Um, who was Gaelic used against? Um, the one who jumped off the ship. Um, yes. Yes. And then the, 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 the High Court declared that Gaelic was not a major European language. <laughs> and that led to a great deal of grief, which we need to go into now. But, um, But so Australia sets up the white Australian policy and it becomes to some extent a model for, for the world. And London not only sort of doesn't oppose it, but helps by finding cloaking forms of words, by finding um, polite ways of doing this dirty work. And it becomes very skilled at this. Yes, you like those words. The, um, as I remarked earlier, the, the British um, we're trying to keep together a multiracial empire with the doctrine that there would be no racial discrimination. But they had to deal with these recalcitrant white societies who were determined to control who could come into their country and the manner in which they came. Uh, so what the British, I mean, the Australians left to themselves would have simply passed legislation as they had done in several of the colonies in 1896, simply prohibiting the entry of anyone from Africa, Asia, or the Pacific Islands. That, they, they were pieces of legislation passed in the Australian colonies before Federation. But the British said, no, no, you can't do that. This would be offensive to uh, many of, of the Queen's subjects. So.